Okay, tonight we're going to be talking about spiritual warfare. Sunday morning we, st- we began this segment of study with uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 in the passage that talks about Satan and who he is. Um, Farron, would you unplug from the back of that monitor I carried out here the that yeah that because I'm hearing it. Yeah, it's coming out those those things there. Test test. I think we're is it coming out there? Okay, let me take a break here. I know how to turn it off. There is a here. Can just turn it down here. Yeah, it wasn't coming through the earphones. There it is, all the way down. Shouldn't be coming through now. Okay, so Sunday morning, what we did, we started with this series or this segment of messages. There'd be three last Sunday morning, which we don't know yet if we got any recording of it at all. Uh, probably not. But um, dealing with the personage of Satan, the fact that Satan is a personal being and not just an idea. He's not just a, a personification of evil. He is a literal personal being, a uh, spiritual being though he be. He is, he is a, a real being to contend with. So we talked about almost exclusively Sunday morning the problem of Satan, who he is, his tactics, how he works, uh, what, what his objectives are in our lives as Christ followers, in the non-believer's life. Uh, and that is a critically important facet of understanding how to live the Christian life. If we don't understand we have an enemy, we don't, and we don't acknowledge that there is an enemy, it's very easy for him to capitalize on exactly who he is, and that is the great deceiver. He is, he is a liar, the Bible says, and the father of lies. He is a deceiver. If we don't know him, don't recognize him, can't, can't administrate, uh, from an administrative standpoint, recognize who he is, then we can't deal with him. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to deal with and I'll, I'll be doing some repeating tonight. I'll repeat some scripture several times, but there, there's a reason each time that's a little different that I'll be repeating them. And the, the idea tonight is to talk about what are the misconceptions and how Christians are now being taught to deal with Satan and to deal with demonic powers. What of that is biblical and what of it is not biblical? And how do we know that? What scripture do we go to when somebody pulls a scripture out of context and says, well, here, right here is what it says you need to do. You need to defeat the enemy by just taking him on. You need to defeat the enemy by using Jesus' name, and he has to bow at your feet by using Jesus' name like a, some kind of incantation. Where do they get those ideas? And when they're ripped from their context, if we go back and look at them in context, can we understand why they were being used and, and, and for those particular times and why we're not, we're not as Christians in the church age given those same powers and authorities. So we need to understand the difference. Again, context. There's a different set of, of uh, gifts and administrations given to the apostles setting up the church age in order that they may be given um, credibility for the establishment of the church. Those things were done specifically for that purpose, and those of us in the church age now, we're told biblically, and we'll look at some of those scriptures tonight, not to use some of those same tactics. And here's what we are to use. So we're going to look, we're going to take those things apart in their context, and that's the objective of some of tonight. I've got a lot of material tonight, so I'm not going to encourage you to engage as much, but please write down your questions, because I do want to deal with them, but we're just going to cover a lot of material. I'm going to do it fast. 
I'm not going to have time to, um, to deal with the back and forth like we normally do, but I do want to engage any questions that you've got. So please write them down. Okay, common questions and misconceptions. Do Christians have the authority to quote-unquote rebuke the devil? How many times have you heard that? Well, just rebuke the devil. You got something coming at you, just rebuke the devil. Rebuke him in Jesus' name. He has no authority against you. Rebuke him in Jesus' name and you will defeat him. Where does that come from? Okay, is it biblical? Is it biblical for us today? The Bible does not give Christians the authority to rebuke the devil, but to resist him. Big difference. Our, our reaction to the devil is not to rebuke him. Here's what, here's what I want you to see. As soon as the devil gets you to engage him in conversation, he wins. As soon as he gets you to engage him in conversation, he wins. Why? Because he's more powerful than any of us. And he can overpower anybody except God himself. So he, if those of us that are walking in Christ, he will n almost never try to take us on with pure, raw power. That's what people are afraid of. They're afraid of his power. But those of us that are walking in Christ, he won't do that because if we're in Christ, Christ is more powerful than him. So he's automatically defeated if we're in Christ and he tries to take us on that way. I, I covered the power Sunday morning. I covered his intellect Sunday morning. He will try to take us on in our, in our intellect. He is smarter than any of us. He knows more than any of us about everything. He knows more about us personally than we know about ourselves. He knows what buttons to push and how to, get our, how to uh, overcome the objections that we might have. If we try to take him on directly, intellectually, with our own mental prowess, we will be defeated there. And we're going to see how we are to take him on intellectually tonight. We do have tools to take him on intellectually. And we, we need, but we need to abide by those tools and not some of these fads that are going through the churches today of trying to take him on ourselves intellectually. You will never learn enough about God. You will never learn enough about the Bible. You'll never learn enough about all of those things to, to use your personal physical, mental intellect to try to take the devil on. So what do we use? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. Resist him, says, James 4, 7 says, submit yourselves then to God. How many times over the last three or four years have, have I said to you, it's about submission. Submission to the Holy Spirit. Submission to his plan. Submission to his word. Submission to his, to his methodologies. It's not about us coming up with newfangled things or trying to take the enemy on or being smarter than him. It's about us submitting to the Holy Spirit and allowing him to fight this battle. Okay. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. There's our key. So the question then becomes, what does resist the devil mean? If it's not taking him on, if it's not rebuking him, what is resisting? We're going to look at that in just a few minutes. Zechariah 3.2 tells us that it is the Lord who rebukes Satan. It is the Lord that is to rebuke Satan. Even Michael, the archangel, one of the most powerful angels, did not dare accuse Satan, but he rather said, the Lord rebuke you. If Michael, the archangel, isn't going to take on Satan himself, we ought not either. The Lord rebuke you, Jude 1, nine. In response to Satan's attacks, a Christian should appeal to Christ. I don't know how many of you have been here, but several times I have acted out this idea that the enemy comes at you, and the devil is here, and he's challenging you, and at least for, for most of us in the male category, our, our tendency is to want to go at him and take him on and defeat him. And the picture we have is to, is to repent from that, which means to turn, 
go the other way back toward Christ and then trust him to take care of him. That's the picture scripturally we have of resisting the devil. Turn your back on him. What greater insult is there to Satan than to simply turn your back on him and trust that Christ is going to take care of him? Trust in Christ is our faith. That's what faith is, is trust in him and not trying to, t- to take him on with our power. We, we can't overpower him. We can't out-intellect him on our, in our own mental prowess. We can't do it. Instead of focusing on defeating the devil, we should focus on following Christ, Hebrews 12, 2, and trust that he will defeat the forces of evil. That is how we resist the devil. We don't resist him by rebuking him. We don't resist him by some kind of uh, Christianized, uh, it's not a Christian, but Christianized incantation that's, that just simply evokes the name of Jesus in some kind of magical formula to try to defeat Satan. That's not a, that's not a Christian response. That is not what we're instructed to do. We are instructed to simply resist which means to turn, go the other way, trust Christ, that's our resistance of Satan. The, most, the best resistance we have is when we are totally, completely in Christ. Then he has no, no power over us. When we're outside of that walk with Christ, he has power in our lives, and we're very vulnerable. Okay, do Christians have the authority to rebuke the devil? It's not necessary for for a Christian to rebuke Satan because God has given us his full armor to stand against evil. Now, I always hesitate a little bit to use Ephesians 6 because I think Christians have made this too cute by far and tried to make it just kind of a, a cartoonized idea of what we are really to be about doing. So I want to take some of the things from Ephesians 6 and talk about them tonight. But I'm going to talk about them not in nearly the depth and detail they deserve. Uh, But I'm going to trust that you go back and study some of this. And if you've got questions about any of the tools of Ephesians 6, by all means write those down and let's deal with them later on as well. Ephesians 6 is the armor of God, for, for those of you that might not know. Uh, The most effective weapons we have against the devil are our faith, and these are the tools of, of the weaponry that were given in Ephesians 6. This is the picture of them. Our faith, wisdom, knowledge about God. Why do we spend so much time talking about who God is and what we need to understand about him rather than just doing uh, more churchy, kinds of things because this is the weaponry our knowledge about God and his word his word is our most powerful resource it's of of all the weaponry we're given the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness the shield of faith uh, the 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 armor of girding yourself with with truth the the sandals uh, of uh, those things are all Every one of them, with the exception of the sword, which is the word of God, are all defensive weapons. The only offensive weapon we have is God's word. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So originally when I started doing this, I was going to have us just stop and read each one of these texts and go through them. But, okay, the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness. That's his righteousness which covers us. We, we live in his righteousness, and by that account, we are righteous. Okay? Um, the shield of faith. When we talk about faith, I think some people think, well, I go to church so I have faith. Or I read the Bible occasionally so I have faith. Uh, faith is genuinely trusting Christ so that when he says this is good and this is bad we take note of that and we avoid the bad and we embrace the good 
and we live that way. That's, that's what, what faith is, is that kind of total trust. Belief in him is not just an intellectual assent. Belief in him biblically is putting our lives in his hands. So that's what faith is. So anything less than putting our lives in his hands, our faith is in question. Okay, does everybody get that? I think sometimes we just make that way to, well, I have faith. I have faith. What do you have faith in? Well, I have faith that Christ is, is the Son of God. I have faith he went to the cross. I have faith that he was resurrected from the grave. I have faith. And have you trusted him in that? Even the devil believes all of that, the Bible says. But ha- have you trusted that that genuinely covers your sin and you live that way? You live by faith and not by sight. Live by not what you see as being the objections, but by what, what it is to walk in him, trusting him to take care of the enemy. The most effective weapons we have against the devil is faith, wisdom, knowledge about God and his word. Christ, when tempted by Satan, answered him with scripture. See Matthew 4, 1 to 11. We'll talk about this again. To gain the, the spiritual victory in spiritual matters, we must maintain a, first a clear conscience. Okay, I am going to stop here on a couple of these. I can't help it, sorry. If we're going to be effective spiritual warriors, we must maintain a, a clean conscience. How do we do that? Some meeting to the Holy Spirit, constantly being aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we're making healthy decisions and not unhealthy decisions, good decisions and not sinful decisions. That that's a constant lifestyle of ours, that we're not just f- focused on, well, I'm a, I'm a kind of a Sunday morning Christian or a Wednesday night Christian or whatever. Uh, Wednesday night Christians, by the way, are really the Christians, you know, if, you're, if you come on Wednesday nights, you must be committed to Christ, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> Gain victory in spiritual matters, we must maintain a clear conscience and have control of our thoughts. So we're, we're going to see biblically what we're told to do in order to do both of those things. We need to have the Bible's answers and not our answers. Well, that's hard. I can't do that. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. You can't do that on your own, and, but there are biblical answers to tell us how to do that. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. This is from 2 Corinthians. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. Part, part of the problem of the commercialized church today is that the commercialized church has painted Satan as somebody that falls into one of two categories. Number one, that you fight with physical warfare. Or number two, that you fight with this pseudo-spiritual warfare, which is, listen very carefully, the spiritual warfare we're given by many, many churches today is demonic spiritual warfare. He is giving us the enemy giving us tools to fight the enemy probably is not going to work. That's why this whole popular idea, I'm convinced, is why this whole popular idea of rebuking the devil yourself has been, I mean, there's a, there's a guy that's written a book. Um, what's, yeah, uh, Neil Anderson. And he's written an adult version and a children's version, which the children's version, I just want to burn every copy I see because kids are so vulnerable to this. Just here's the formulas for dealing with Satan that are nothing more than incantations that have been Christianized that are nothing but from the occult. You don't take Satan on with occultic tactics. And that's, that's what we've been given, many, many cases, in churches. On the contrary, 
Uh, let's see, the weapons we fight are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they, are, they have divine power. And here's the divine power of the weapons we use. It says they are used to demolish strongholds. Wouldn't you like to demolish the strongholds of the enemy? We're, we're told how to do that biblically. We demolish arguments. Why do we study apologetics? Because apologetics told, tells us how to demolish strongholds of the enemy. Demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments. Every pretension, the Bible says, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5. We could spend months on that one verse. But let me, let me just say, go back and read that. Grab some of the commentaries out of this front, front little library up here. All that's commentaries back there on, the, on 2 Corinthians. And look at some, com- some of the commentators' work with regard to this. Demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Everything that comes against the knowledge of God is from the devil. Ultimately, from the devil. Why he doesn't want us to know God. If we genuinely believe to know God is to love God, and I do, the enemy doesn't want you to know God because he doesn't want you to love God. He certainly doesn't want you to trust God and trust his word. He doesn't want us to have that kind of confidence in being led by the Holy Spirit and by the word of the living God. That's what we're up against. And he says, we are to demolish strongholds, but we're to do that in the way that God says do it. We're not to take him on in our own prowess. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. What does that mean? Every thought that comes in our head that wants to lead us down the wrong road. Every thought that comes into our head, we go, well, that seems a little questionable. Every thought that comes in our head that goes, oh, you don't need to be in church you, this today. You don't need to study God's word. You don't need to spend time in the Bible today. You, you haven't got time to pray today. All of those things that take us away from God, all of those kinds of thoughts, it says, stop. Don't make a decision on that right now. Stop and take that captive before Christ. What, what does Christ say about that? What does Christ say about that thought that ran through my head? What does Christ say about that thought that was, that was tempting me to sin? What does Christ say about that thought about how I think about other people? Or how I'm dealing with certain other people? Or how I'm spending my time? All of those thoughts are... You know, it, it's just, it's so easy for me to go, well, I'd as soon not go to the prison on Saturday. I'd as soon not go to the mission on Wednesday. I mean, I've got to be back here on Wednesday night. I'd as soon not. Dave, you're tired. You've, you've, look what you've done this week. I mean, sometimes he'll pat me on the back. The devil will pat me on the back. Look at everything you've done this week. You don't need to be a part of that. He'll actually want me to feel good about what I've done in order to keep me from doing something else. That's the deceiver. The enemy is a deceiver. He takes us away from the things of God. But we take every thought captive to Christ and subject and submit those thoughts to Christ. That's what that that is telling us we need to do. So what are the foundational mistakes Christians make in trying to deal with the devil and the demonic minions? There are two primary area, errors in, that I see Christians make. Bless you. The, the first of those errors is to make such a big deal of Satan that he seems like he's, he's, that he cannot be defeated even by God. And to start seeing Satan behind every bush, every nook and cranny, every bad thing that happens, every little temptation that comes my way, that Satan's personally behind that. I think that's a mistake. On the other side of things is to cartoonize Satan 
and see him as the little red guy with the pitchfork and the long red tail with a point on the end. And he's just kind of this cute little icon of evil that is easily handled. And all I've got to do is, is fall into one of these categories of evoking the name of Jesus or some other kind of incantation or rebuking him in my own power in the name of Jesus or rebuking him by the word of God, rebuking, rebuking, rebuking. The Bible says resist, resist. Okay, so both of those are mistakes. Too much emphasis on Satan, people live in total fear. And people should not live in total fear. People that are in Christ need not ever fear. So to live in fear is, a, is not what God would have us to do. To, to totally discount the reality of Satan or to minimize him in any way as a real threat is also a, a very bad thing for us to, to take on and, and try to, to dismiss him too lightly. So others completely ignore the spiritual realm and the fact that the Bible tells us the, Bible, the, the battle is against spiritual powers. Our battle as Christians is against the spiritual powers. I gave an example Sunday morning of what had happened just this, this past Sunday morning. All of our equipment's down. I'm preaching about the power and the personage of Satan and our monitors are down back there. You know, I come in here and nothing's working. Is that spiritual warfare? He can have effect on, on physical things. And he does. He can lead us in our minds toward doing things that are detrimental to ourselves and to others. Sometimes by charming us, sometimes by just telling us what, that that's really not bad after all, and sometimes by patting us on the back and telling us how good we are, we don't need to go any further. All of those are tactics of the deceiver. Spiritual warfare is finding the biblical balance between holding Satan in such esteem that you're fearful of everything in life and ignoring him altogether. The Apostle Paul instructs Christians to wage war against the sin in themselves first. Here is our first attack on Satan. You want to deal with Satan in a way that, that is constructive, we deal with sin in our own lives first. To know to do good and not to do it, the Bible says, is sin. To know to do good and not to do it, God's word says, is sin. So how do I deal with that sin in my own life? How, how am I going to deal with that? So the, to deal with the sin in my own life, Romans 6, and it warns us to oppose the schemes of the devil by arming ourselves with the armor of God in Ephesians 6. Okay, Again, let, let's just think about that. The gospel of peace the, the uh, breastplate of his righteousness, the helmet of salvation. Now, when we talk about the gospel of peace, which we will in a minute, that's, that's not talking about the gospel of John 3.16. Gospel just means good news. So the good news of peace, you, your reference there is Philippians 4. And in Philippians 4, there's three different kinds of peace that are talked about. And if you want to be able to deal with the enemy with some degree of confidence, you want to do so with peace. Ephesians, or Philippians 4 talks about peace first off with God. Peace with God. And that's, that's in our salvation. Peace with God means that he has taken on and paid for our sin, is paid for in full, therefore we can have peace, genuine peace with God. We're no longer the enemies that, that Romans 5 talks about uh, of God. We're no longer the enemies of God. We're at peace with God. Second one is, is, he says, you need to know the God of peace. You need to know him. You need to know him well. You need to know his character, his attributes, who he is, 
how he functions, what, what, his, what his nature is, so that you can come to trust on it, trust in him. So you've got to know the God of peace. And then you've got to have, you gotta have this uh, peace that passes all human understanding. That is this peace of uh, genuinely living with this God of peace. Living with him every day. That living with him is, is what our faith is really all about. Okay, things to remember quickly. We've got to know our enemy. That's what we did last Sunday morning. Here's the three things we talked about um, itemized in the next few slides. First off, he is, he is a being of ultimate hatred. He hates God. He hates those who love God. He hates Christ followers. He is a, he is a being that functions and lives on the, the, the passion of hatred. That's who he is. He says he's roaming around like a lion seeking whom he may devour. To devour means to destroy. He's out to destroy your spirit. He's out to destroy your faith, that is your trust in God. He's out to destroy your physical body. Why? If he can destroy your physical body or cause you to destroy your physical body or cause you to allow others to destroy your physical body before you have a relationship with Christ, he has achieved his goal. Your chances of ever receiving Christ are over. So that's his temptation. He wants you to destroy your spirit, but he wants to destroy your body as well. And he wants to destroy the testimony of every believer. Why are believers challenged? Not because he thinks he can have your soul. That's, once you've accepted Christ, that's a done deal. He, wants, he comes after believers to destroy your testimony. Satan is all-powerful, so he's not only a being of, of uh, not all-powerful, excuse me, he's, all, he's more powerful than any man, more powerful than any being other than God. We can't take on the power of Satan. And that's what this book that I was telling you about really tries to get us to do is to take him on in his power. You will be defeated every time by trying to take Satan on in his power. He's more powerful than any man, more powerful than any being except God. Our hope then is to, only, is to be hidden in Christ or in God and be protected by him. That is our hope of escaping his power. And in Ephesians 6, 10 to 12 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you may stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What is that telling us? Everywhere you go, and when he's talking about heavenly realms, biblically there are three sort of layers of heavenly realms and and the enemy has in this layer of the heavenly realms which is the air we breathe and this atmosphere we're living in satan has control he is the king the prince of the power of the air he has authority here and so we need to know how to deal with him here and that's the powers he's using are the spiritual powers. They're not physical powers. They're intellectual powers. This text teaches some critical truths or crucial truths. We can only stand strong in the Lord's power, uh, and we can't do it in our own power. It is God's armor that protects us. Our battlefield is ultimately against spiritual forces of the evil in the world. Again, go back and look at those those things from Ephesians 6 that were talked about there. If you've got questions about them, write those things down because that the, dealing with those things appropriately and not just looking at them as cute little examples is, is how to live the Christ life and to live it victoriously. Ephesians 6, 13 to 18 is a description of spiritual armor God gives us. We are to stand firm with a belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, that's his righteousness which covers us and that is imputed to us the gospel of peace again the good news of peace is not the gospel of john 3 16 but the gospel of having peace with god the good news 
that we can have peace with God. The shield of faith, the shield and the breastplate are protecting your heart, essentially. That's the center. And interestingly, in Hebrew thought, the heart is not the center of emotion. The heart is the center of thought. In Hebraic thought, the heart is the center of thought. Uh, What do these pieces of spiritual armor represent in spiritual warfare? We know the truth, we believe the truth, and speak the truth. So it's all about truth. We are to proclaim the gospel no matter how much resistance we face. We are not to waver in our faith, that is our trust in God. Trust in God's promises no matter how strong we are attacked. Our ultimate defense is the assurance we have of our salvation. Get down to the end of of, uh, the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And what does he tell you the reasoning is for his writing all of this? That you may know. That you may know. He says, I write all of this that you may know that you have this salvation. There should never be a wonder in any, in any person's mind that once you've accepted Christ, based on his promise, not based on how I feel, but based on his promise, you can know that you have that salvation. Our offensive weapon is the word of God. That's the only offensive tool here. A shield is defensive, a breastplate is defensive, even, uh, ev- even these other pieces of armor, like the helmet, is defensive. It's all to fire against the fiery darts of the, of the evil one. So everything that, that's there is about, our, is about truth. And the only thing we have that's an offensive weapon is God's word. Let me, let me, just, let me put it to you this way, because I think maybe somebody said this to me one time, and it made a whole lot of sense. Any... Every, every weapon that you pick up to, as an offensive weapon against the enemy that is not the word of God, is not ordained by God, is being an offensive weapon against the enemy, and therefore it will fail. Does that make sense? So my picking up and trying to use these incantations, even in Jesus' name, they're going to fail. Why? Because the word of God is the weaponry he uses. If Christ used it, it's probably not too good for me or too uh, beyond my, the, the possibility that I should use it. And we're going to see that he used it. Okay, so we are to proclaim the gospel no matter what the resistance. Our ultimate defense is the assurance of our salvation and assurance that no spiritual force can take away. Offensive, our offensive weapon is the word of God not our opinions and not our feelings. Not the latest Christianized fad. Not the prayer of Jabez, which was for Jabez. Not things ripped from their context. Things that were given by God's word is our ultimate weapon. Our offensive weapon is the Word of God, not our own opinions, not our feelings, not the latest fad. We are to pray in the power and the will of the Holy Spirit by His power and by His will. Look at this mess I've made, God. Come bless my mess. The um, after effect of of saying, I'm going to go do ministry, but I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it in my timing. I'm going to do it. No, this is 
God's ministry? And how would he have me do it? Satan's primary weapon is his intellect. So we see that his, he uses his power, but he also uses his intellect. We covered this Sunday morning. More intellect than any other being except God himself. His principal intellectual weapon is deceit, deception, diversion, distraction. He knows human nature better than any any other being in the universe except God. So he knows where our buttons are. He knows how to push, and he knows us personally better than we know ourselves. So here's, here's where, what I would say to you. If, if, if all of this is true, and it is biblically, we, we need to recognize his tactics when we see them. And we go, we've got to be able to go, at least be able to go, that just might be the devil. This looks good, feels good, looks right, but it just might be the devil. The devil can tempt you with your family, and family's a good thing. He can tempt you by patting you on your back about your ministry, and that's a good thing. He can tempt you with good things, and that's, that's, not, that's not beyond the realm of possibility, but we need to recognize, is this the enemy setting me up for his ultimate success in my life? Do I, need, do I need to challenge this thought? Do I need to take this thought captive before Christ? And the answer is, to that is always yes. It's always yes. Know your enemy. Jesus is the ultimate example of resisting temptation. You probably have heard this preach before. Observe how Jesus handles direct attacks from Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness in Matthew 4. Each temptation was combated with the words, It is written. It is written, it is written. So each time the Satan attacks Jesus or tempts him, in, in essence is what he's doing, just do this and you can avoid the cross. Just do this and you can feed your hungry body. Just do this. And, and to feed our hungry body is not a bad thing. To accomplish God's will in your life the most effective way is not necessarily a bad thing. See, what he's doing to Jesus is tempting him with things he knows Jesus is here to accomplish and he's not going to live long enough if he doesn't feed his body he can, he can short circuit the cross by just simply bowing down to Satan one time just a moment in time he can avoid all of that heartache and hurt and pain and suffering and Satan gives him that out to do but that's not God's will and so Jesus has to come back and use the offensive weapon that he has, which is God's word. So look, go back and look at those Matthew 4 passages, and you'll see that Jesus every time is using the word of God. The word of the living God is the most powerful weapon against the temptation of the devil. In Psalm 119, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Here's, here's what the, the temptations of the devil does. The devil tempts you even to good things, in order to cause you to sin against God. I can choose things that are good that aren't the best thing God has for me. And if the good thing takes me away from the best thing, then I have sinned ultimately against my God. Why? Because he's created better things for me to accomplish with my with my resources, with my time, my energy, my effort, my love, my passions. A reminder and a word of caution concerning spiritual warfare here. Again, I'm going to bring this to your attention. The name of Jesus is not a magic incantation that causes demons to flee from before us. That is simply a lie straight from the devil himself. The seven sons of Sceva are an example of what can happen when people presume an authority they do not have and have not been given. And again, we don't have time to go into that story again tonight, but look at Acts 19 and you can see that story for yourself. 
Even Michael the archangel, I'll remind you again, did not rebuke Satan. He said, the Lord rebuke you. When we start taking, talking to the devil, we run the risk, and indeed we're opening the door to be led astray, just as Eve was in the Garden of Eden. Don't start a conversation with the devil. <laughs> just don't start a conversation with him. Answer him with God's word. Trust Christ. Turn and trust Christ. Our focus should be on God, not demons. We speak to God and not demons. Okay? It's crucial that every Christian understand that he or she is in a spiritual battle. There's a spiritual battle, as I said Sunday morning, going on in this church. Every time we open the doors, there's a spiritual war going on right here in this place for your attention, for your love, for your focus, for your time, for your energy, for your effort, for, for your bringing this in and really making it a part of your life. There's a war going on for that. For you to be distracted, dissuaded, uh, talked out of, talked into something else, all of those things are just the tools of the enemy. There's no way to get out of it. Awareness of the spiritual battle around us is very important. Not only awareness, but vigilance. Be prepared. Understand what your tools are. To have the courage to step up will only come, that courage only comes, I'm convinced, as we understand what God's given us as our weapons. The words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Our weapons and warfare are not of the flesh, but divine pow divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses, we are, destroy, we are to destroy speculations, every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. What, is it, what does the enemy do? He whispers in your ear all of these speculations. I gave examples of that Sunday morning. Well, what's, what's Pastor Tom talking about? He's back there looking at me, and he's talking to this other person, and they're both laughing, and they're looking at me. What are what they saying? Well, must, they must be saying something bad about me. Speculations. Those are evil speculations. I don't know what's going on. Take the speculate, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that the enemy raises up against the knowledge of God. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It is clear that our warfare as Christians is spiritual. It's not a physical war. And we're to use the spiritual tools God gives us and not the spiritual tools of the enemy. We are not fighting a physical battle, but a, but a human battle, or a human battle. It is on a spiritual level. Its enemies, its prerogatives, its fortresses, its weapons are all spiritual. If we attempt to fight the spiritual with human weapons, we will fail, and the enemy will be victorious. I'll add to that what I've already said one more time. And if we use spiritual weapons that are of the devil, we will fail. It's important to note that Paul is not speaking about battling demons here. When Jesus and the apostles cast demons out, it was along with the other signs and wonders they exhibited, primarily to prove the authority that they, of what they said was true. It was important at that time, again, here's where context comes in, it was important at that time for God to give the apostles a powerful proof that they were indeed from God and his spokesman. The fidelity of Scripture depends on the authority of the apostles. So God gave the apostles his power to authenticate their teachings. This is really important to separate this from the tools that we have in our disposal. The points all, all along was to show that the ultimate authority and our ultimate spiritual weapon is the Scripture. We, the apostles were pointing to scripture they were pointing and improving it by the power of God and our weapon is the scripture as well the kind of spiritual battle that every Christian engages in is primarily a battle for the mind and the heart if the enemy can capture these or divide these he's got us if all we're doing, and I used to tell the guys in seminary this, 
I don't care how smart you get or how much you know about the Bible. If you're trusting in this, to have a relationship with Christ without the heart, you will fail. If you're, if you're only acting from emotion, you will fail. Why? Because God's given us both of those things to keep us in check. And one helps the other. According to 2 Corinthians 10, there are spiritual fortresses in the world made of these speculations and lofty things. We just need to be prepared to deal with them. It means ideas, concepts, reasons, philosophies. These are all, the, all kinds of tools of the enemy. Uh, in Greek, it's the logismos, um, the logic. People of the world build up these logics to protect themselves against the truth of God. Somebody asked um, Aldous Huxley, I think it was, who was one of the, the authors of the, the Humanist Manifesto One. Why have you taken on a humanist view? And Huxley said, because it's what I want to, it's how I want to live, and it's the most convenient thing for my thoughts. Now go back and read about his life, and you'll see some of the choices he made were strictly because that's what he wanted to do. And he, he, he came with all of these speculations, these concepts, these reasonings, these philosophies of life that were totally antithetical to any kind of reality, but they suited him, and he lived a horrible life and ended up in some very desperate places in his last days. People of the world build up these logics to protect themselves against the truth of God. Huxley did not want to know the truth of God. Sadly, these fortresses become prisons. Uh, eventually, they become tombs. As Christians, we are called to break down these fortresses and rescue the inhabitants. That's, that's our mission. That's our goal. Why do we do what we do here? Why do we even bother with the AV? I mean, if we can't get some help back here for, for a farin, that's just going to close down. You know how many lives are affected by that? I told Farron before you, most of you got here tonight, I've been sending these videos back for over 15 years. There is a well-oiled machine in southern Africa for these videos. And hundreds of, li of direct, direct lives are going to be affected, and thousands because of the work that they do, those hundreds do. Because we, we don't, we either do this or we don't do it. And the enemy will attack that, including the equipment. He'll cause batteries to die in less than an hour. Unfortunately, one of the enemy's best tricks is getting us to fight with human weapons rather than divine ones. When fighting against worldly philosophies, human wit and, and weaponry are the human wit and weaponry are of the, of, uh, the humanity is, is of no avail. Marketing techniques, counter philosophies, persuasive words of human wisdom, rationalism, organization, skill, entertainment, mystique, better lighting, better music, these are all just human weapons. This is the marketing tools we use to market church today. And yet we're not teaching about doing ministry a whole lot anymore. They're just human weapons. None of these things will win a spiritual war. The only thing that is effective, the only offensive weapon we possess is this, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How did I do? Wow, right on time. Thank you. So, covered a lot of ground, lots of scripture, lots of places to go back and study if you're so inclined. Any thoughts or comments? I do have a thought and a comment. Um, most of my life, I, I've been, I realized that like I'm on a basketball court in the world. And somebody or a thought is passed to me that's wrong. 
I can either turn my back and walk off, let the ball hit me and fall off, or I can grab it, play with it, pass it along. I kind of think of it in those kind of terms. Mm. And what I always was taught that if you say in the name of Jesus, see, I never have heard, I resisted the devil by not catching the ball, but I didn't turn to the word of God. I thought that if I just resisted, didn't take the ball, then I would have the power. No wonder I've been spinning my wheels for so long mm. <laughs> because this is a new thing. I mean, I knew the verse, but I didn't really know how to do it. Mm. Now I've learned a lot tonight how to Good. do it. And I, all I can say is I've been in some bad situations and environments on my own doing, and the Lord protected me all that way, and I didn't even know it. Mm. And that's why I'm here right now. Yeah, praise God. What a t- testimony. Thank you for that. And I think it might have been when we were went over that uh, part about Satan in our uh, in our um, in our what do you call that? Our church do- not doctrine, but Statement of faith. Statement of faith where you mm-hmm. put Satan in there. And one of the things, I think that's when you talked about it, that he's a beautiful, he was a beautiful angel. Mm. And that he knows when to present himself as something as beauty. And that was a real profound thought to me. Because, yeah, go back it, because you do think about him as being ugly and, and, and so easy to identify. Yeah. And that put it kind of in a different perspective. Go back me. and look at the first chapter of Ezekiel at how how Satan is described and the words will carry I mean if you just get into the the words and and you realize and don't think about it being Satan you will be carried away and easily fall in love with the being being described beautiful colors uh, clever powerful all of those things that that humanity seeks you know we want we want power well satan will give you power the back end's not real real healthy but but he will give you power for the moment he will let you delude yourself with whatever you want to delude yourself with whether it's drugs or alcohol or particular people or whatever it is he'll he'll do that And like I said earlier tonight, he'll even pat you on the back. You know, I'm I'm convinced that uh, there was a a time in our church in Arkansas that we were doing lots of stuff. And it was a big church, 750 people uh, on the rolls. and, And we were doing, you know, these VBSs that, Children were coming from, from miles and miles and miles around, and it was a spectacular. I mean, we, we spent huge amounts of money on these things. And when we got through, you know, we, we kind of walked around like we were the cock of the walk, you know. Look at me. Look at us. We're the best church in town. Look at what we did. And, and when you really got down to analyzing what we did, we put on a show. And the whole community was patting us on the back. We were being made to feel good about ourselves, and we, I'm convinced that, that we did more harm than good because we convinced ourselves that we had done the best thing when what we did is just threw money at, at, at something and, and said, we're, we'll call it best because we spent more than we ever had before. It was more spectacular than ever before. We had the longest water slide in the state. Those are human tools. Those, those, aren't, those aren't godly tools. And to misunderstand that, we had gone so wrong. And I had this conversation with our church leadership, and they thought I was just full of mud when I started talking about this. You know, I'm, well, let's just look. Look how, many, look how many kids there were there. I don't care if there was a thousand more kids than there were there. Did, did we really tear down the barriers and give these kids the tools to live better Christian lives? Did we do that? 
Why, why are we doing what we're doing here? You know, I, I want there to be those that will come alongside Pastor Tom and I and somebody that will take over that prison ministry in the next year. I don't have any idea who that's going to be right now because I've got nobody except Curtis going with me. And Curtis is old faithful. He's here. He'll pull up his Jeep right out here. Uh, yeah. He'll pull up his Jeep out here, and he's usually 25 to, to sometimes 50 minutes early. Yeah, that's right. That's what he keeps telling me. If you're in the concrete business, you've got to be early. Can't be late. <laughs> that's right. So... Uh, but he, you know, that's, we need, we need men in this church that will step up and take that on. We need, we need men or women to come join Farron back here and learn what needs to be done. Because, you know, I, I just fiddled with this for probably six hours longer than I needed to to figure out how to hook up that monitor for him tonight, for this one night. Somebody that knew what they were doing could have come in here and done that in less than a minute. They would have seen the problem, know what needed to be done, take it, fix it, get it working. So what happens? The enemy takes me out of the time that I need to be spending doing the things I need to be doing in order to do that. That's the way the enemy works. He just does. So... Again, Linda, thank you for that testimony. I appreciate it. <coughs> Years ago, there was a, band, a local, a Humboldt County band. It's called Lighthouse the Band. And they would give concerts. In fact, they were the ones that gave a huge concert to get Caleb in Humboldt County. Hmm. And um, the one lead fiddle player, credit, all of them were incredible musicians but he gave the testimony about when he first broke into music business he was not a believer and he got hooked up with this producer and basically was promised the world he'd be famous he'd be this he'd be that he'd be and he said you guys are going to think I'm crazy but he wanted me to sign a, a contract and basically it said I sell my soul to you hmm. And he said, he said, I, he knows it was from the Lord, but he said, it dawned on me, if there was a devil, then there had to be a God. And he wanted to know that, that being. Mm -hmm. And I always remember that story because it was so profound and wow. it touched a lot of the young people in the audience because that's what most people want. They want what the world offers. They want, you know. Yeah. And um, in the news today, it had a big... Google News had this big um, expose on one of the Kardashians, which I always cringe whenever I see their names. But the youngest, whatever, Kylie, whatever, she, anyway, she's getting ready to turn 21. And she's going to be the first, the youngest billionaire in the world by the end of this year. And I just think about how many people that affects. And I, and I thought about this one this man that gave his testimony if there's if there's a devil then there's a god mm -hmm. not that that is our justification but yeah. it was just yeah. that simple in his mind yeah. <coughs> to give you your own words from a week or so ago you know it's amazing what god is doing with such a small group of people and it, how much more exciting is it that there's just a, a pittance of us, you know, here and uh, intermittently too, because we're all, you know, dodging things. And um, it's cool that you're here to teach us, like you did tonight. These are God's instructions one, two, three turn, submit, and trust. I mean, that's it. Don't do anything else, don't waste time on anything else, just cut right to the chase. Do what you're told. Yeah. Problem. <sighs> All right. Know your enemy. Use the tools God's given us. So Sunday morning we'll continue with um, the answer, 
which ultimately is Christ, and more specifically how to deal with some of these. I would encourage you to go back and look at some of the scripture we, we passed over way too quickly and way too lightly tonight, and, and then go back and look at that description of Satan as he's first described in Ezekiel. That's, uh, and you see why it's so easy to be enticed, tantalized, seduced by him. He was created to be God's emissary. All right, let's close out in prayer. Father, I do pray tonight that we would take note that you've given each one of us opportunities to realize who the enemy is, how he works, what he does to try to dissuade us from being the tools that you've called us to be, the, the gifts that you've, called, that you've given to us to use in, in being your, your emissaries in this world. The resources that we have, Lord, the talents and the gifts that we have that you've gift, gifted us so generously with. And now, Lord, we, we pray that you would cause us to take every thought captive, every seduction captive, every temptation captive, and take it back before Christ, which is our, our measure. And we, we pray, Lord, tonight that we would neither focus too strongly nor, nor too lightly on the enemy, not so strongly that we walk in fear, and not so lightly that we discard and, dis and set aside the things that, uh, that we should be aware of and should be attentive to in terms of making those changes in our own lives. And Lord, I do thank you tonight that you have given us a warning and you've shown us exactly who the enemy is, what he's like, what his, what his aggressions are, uh, how, how comforted he is when we just don't take him seriously, how easily we can be manipulated even to do good things in the, in the light of the better things that you had prepared for us. Lord, help us to be the effective tools for your kingdom and use us for your honor and glory. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.